and uh, I don't know how well you know Brother Chris, he's a great resource. I want to say just a quick word about the Southern Baptist Convention, because I'm not sure how much uh, you know about it. Uh, and that's true of a lot of people who go to any of our churches don't necessarily know a lot about Southern Baptist. So in Southern Baptist, uh, Chris mentioned 40 something thousand churches. In fact, like 47 of them, so it's, it's huge. And uh, all, all of our churches are just like this. Uh, they're what we call autonomous, which means you've got a pastor and you pray, you do what God wants you to do as you read the Bible. Nobody tells you what to preach or what to do. The reason we're, we come together is for missions. That, that, that's why we come together. Now here's what I want you to know. In the Southern Baptist Convention, we have uh, a national organization. We have what we call an international mission board, which is huge. And I will tell you this. Uh, guys who, like in our state, we have an executive director, Thomas Hammond. Every state convention has like the top boss for us. And they will tell you that when they meet with other uh, denominations, and I hear this all the time, they meet with other leaders from other groups, that one thing that the groups will say is, we wish we had a block of program. We wish we had what y'all have because of the work that we get to do. For example, because of what we do, uh, I can come here today well, Chris can come here. Nobody owes us anything, and that's that's just it, it, it's unless you know that system, it just seems amazing uh, that you can do that. I, I went Thursday night to uh, Danvers, Georgia, uh, which is quite a drive, and and taught some pastors. It was over with. Got my car headed back home. They don't owe me anything because of the car department. It's a, it's a tremendous thing. We have the IND, which sends missionaries worldwide. We have the North American Mission Board, which concentrates on North America. They uh, they do more than this, but they do a lot of church planting. They also uh, do a lot with helping churches that used to be larger and need to be revitalized. Uh, in Georgia, and this is something that, that's real crucial to know, in Georgia, we have different guys serving the Georgia Baptist Mission Board that have specific roles. So for example, I'm going to talk to some about evangelism today, but what you need to know is, as you, do, as you do your church, there's people who work with us that are uh, specialists in certain things. For example, if, if you said, or if a church said to me, we are really weak in Sunday school or small groups. Well, in this region, we have a guy named P.J. Dunn. That's, that's all he does is, is works on discipleship. And because of that, he studies it. He looks at He's in all these different churches. So he would probably impress you. Uh, he is smart, but not because he's smart. That's not what would impress you. It's because he sees so much things in different churches that whatever you're facing, he can say, hey, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Uh, we have someone who works with music. Uh, we have someone who works with the next gen. Chris mentioned Vacation Bible School. Do you all do Vacation Bible School? Some churches do, some churches don't. You know what Vacation Bible School is? Vacation Bible School is uh, an event that normally happens in the summer. Hence, we call it Vacation. I didn't hear you. PBS. Yeah, PBS. PBS. Vacation Bible School. Yes. So we've got a person, full-time Jenny Carter, who does training in that. Uh, she was a children's uh, director at a church for I think 17 or 18 years in Macon. She's been with us a long time. Uh, she can tell you more than you want to know about children's ministry and, and vacation Bible school. I'm just saying that there's resources. And when I leave that, I'm going to give you a, one of my cards and some information. Uh, anytime anything comes up, the first thing I would do is talk to Brother Chris. Just, hey, here's what we're, we need some help with this. And a lot of times he's just going to be able to say, hey, I can help you with doing that. Or he may tell you, why, why don't you contact or put you in contact with somebody with the state convention that specializes uh, in that. So I just I wanted you to know that because there's resources there. And and not everybody knows that, although we always send out emails, always talk about what we're doing. Had a young pastor uh, just a few months ago. A couple of us did some things for him in his church. 
And so he calls me one day and he says, and he's real excited, he said, uh, y'all need to promote this. And I'm, I, I ain't know what he's talking about. That's his first words. Hey, man, y'all need to be promoting this. I said, promoting what? He said, all that y'all are doing. And I said, well, actually, we do promote what we're doing. Just not, not everybody knows about it. Because he probably got emails and seen all kinds of stuff that we do. But until he got us in to actually help him do something, he just wasn't aware of the fact that there are guys, like, for example, you asked me too much about children's ministry. I pastor a church. I, I had a full-time children's person. I don't know a lot about children's ministry. I've never done children's ministry. If you ask me about music, I love music. I don't know anything about creating a music program. But I saw it just to say that we've got people who can come. Anytime you need anything, there's probably somebody uh, who can help you with that course association. You've got a great uh, association mission strategists who can help you uh, either he'll, he knows and he'll help you or he's going to be able to meet with children ministry or something. It's like, let me connect you with the state convention. Uh, and they can help you. And sometimes Brother Chris will know a church that might be in your association that has went through the same problem or the same obstacle. I'm going to talk about evangelism, about, about reaching people. And let me, let me read a verse. For, uh, Mark chapter 1, if you have your Bible or your phone, to want to look at this. Mark chapter 1. Famous, famous verses. You've all heard these verses. Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. I'm reading from a King James, so it might be a little bit different. But Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. Now, as he, Jesus, walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said to them, Come after me, I will make you to become fishers of men. And immediately they forsook their nets and followed him. Everything I do in evangelism, I do off of what I call, and this is just some inside information, what I call a blueprint. In other words, I have a little, what I call a blueprint. And anytime I do anything in evangelism, it fits somewhere in my blueprint. For example, tomorrow uh, I'm going to a, a church in northwest Georgia, and they want some training in personal evangelism. Well, that fits in my blueprint. And, and there's nothing that anyone asks me to do that doesn't somehow fit in that blueprint. I say it because I've discovered when churches operate off of a blueprint to reach people, I've never seen one that didn't reach people. I mean, I've just never seen one that, that did not reach some people because the blueprint is just biblical principles of how the New Testament church reached people. And y'all know what a blueprint is. It's like this building... Before it was built, somebody drew up a blueprint. That's why there's a bathroom there. They, they, they knew exactly, they looked at that blueprint and they put everything exactly where that blueprint. If you've you ever built anything, sometimes folks will draw up a blueprint and before the actual building goes up, they'll look at it and say, hey, we really would like a blueprint, I mean, like a bathroom over on that side too. And they'll just have to, you know, draw in you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the missions for a bathroom. But if you don't change anything, this building looks exactly like that blueprint did. And so we operate off a of blueprint. So I want to make some statements uh, from, from my blueprint and from the verses that we read. In the New Testament, there's two illustrations about witnessing used over and over. Uh, this one's not the primary one that's used, but it's a famous one. Uh, and that is we can't, we're casting a net. They were fishermen. And Jesus takes what they know and he says, instead of fishing for fish, you're going to fish for people. The other illustration he used was sowing seeds because they lived in the agricultural society. He talks about the harvest. Uh, he talks about uh, the fields are white, they're red. And so what that means is, if I'm going to reach people, and I did this while I was a pastor, if I'm going to reach people, I'm always looking and asking myself this question. In what ways is our church intentionally falling out the net? In what ways is our church sowing seeds? Because here's, here's what doesn't happen. You never reap a harvest that you haven't sown. Give you an example. I have friends who every summer 
will have a little garden. I don't ever have a garden. They have a garden, and so you'll see, sometimes they'll tell me, or I'll just see on Facebook or you know, Instagram or social media, they'll say, look at these tomatoes. It would be crazy for me to say, I would like to have some of those kind of tomatoes. I'm going to go out in my backyard and see if I've got any. You don't have tomatoes if you didn't sow it. You don't have corn if you didn't sow it. And everybody you know, shakes their head, are you sponsored? So, of course. There are churches that don't understand why they're not reaching people. And the problem is they're not casting the net. They're not sowing seeds. And so let me just walk you through my blueprint. If I want to pastor a church tomorrow, for example, if I had become the pastor of this church, of course God's called you here, but if I had become the pastor, within the first week, I would find out whoever the person is who goes here that would know the answer to these two questions. I, I, I would pay to know this. Number one, does the church have many first-time visitors? In other words, is it normal to have people visit on Sunday? Because I can tell you why I want you to know this. In the state of Georgia, every county tomorrow, every, there's no exception, every county tomorrow will have about 80% of their county at home. They won't be in church. Which means this, it doesn't matter what county I pastor in, most people don't go to church. In fact, let me just tell you this. In Georgia, we have almost 11 million people. The next time we do a census, we'll have 11 million. We're a growing state. In the last 12 months, 70% of Georgians did not go to church one time. I'll say it again. We have about 11 million people. In the last 12 months, about 7, about 7 million people did not go to church once. They didn't go to Easter they didn't go to a wedding. They did not step inside a church building. Now that sounds bad. It's actually worse than that. Because when they do this survey and they ask people, did you go to church last 12 months? If a person said, yeah, I went to, I went, I went on, on Easter. Well, then you don't count. You, you, you went to church. Well, one time a year is not much. So most people don't go to church. I want to know, do we have any first time guests? I'll tell you why I want to know that. If, if you told me we don't, that tells me you're not inviting people. Because if we're inviting people, they all don't come, but some people come. Second question I'm going to ask is this. If you tell me we do have a number of first-time guests, it's very much uh, a normal Sunday to have a guest. Now, I don't say you have it every Sunday, but you would say two, two three Sundays a month, we, we have first-time guests. I'm going to ask you this. Do you know what percent of first time guests come back. Because if you if you said this, well pastor, most of them don't come back. They come one time. You know what that tells me? They're seeing something they don't like. I need to find out what they don't like. It could be music, it could be that they feel like you don't have you don't have anything for my family, like I've got young children, I've got high school students. I need to find out the answer to those two questions. We have very many visitors. And secondly, do if we do have visitors, do we have a high percent that come back for a second, third, fourth visit? And those are crucial things to know. Then I would say this on the blueprint, and it's, it's, I'm just going to mention it because Brother Chris actually talked a whole, whole lesson on it. Leadership. Churches are never evangelistic unless there's a leader. And I don't mean just you expect the pastor, yes. But there all, also has to be other leaders. Churches that are evangelistic have evangelistic deacons, or evangelistic small group Sunday school teachers, evangelistic uh, lay leaders in the church. In fact, this is what Jesus is doing. Jesus was a leader, and Jesus knew the success of what he wanted to do was based on, I need to raise up other leaders. In other words, he was he witnessed to everybody, and he saw people saved. Uh, for example, the thief on the cross who responded to Jesus, who, who Jesus said the day would be when in paradise. That person never became a leader. Not everybody becomes a leader. Uh, Zacchaeus, I don't know what 
what the end result of Zacchaeus was. I know he got saved. But here Jesus is calling the leaders. Now this story, by the way, that I read is found in Mark 1, it's found in Matthew 4. The Luke 5 uh, version of it, uh, Luke 5, verse 1 through 11, sheds an insight here. Figure of Mark. Uh, Mark is a short gospel. He don't give you much detail. He just gets right, he just gets right into it. Just, just, here's what happened. There's not a lot of details. And so if you didn't know the other uh, gospels, what they say, you would think, that, and I thought this when I was young, it seemed like Jesus walked by and didn't even know this guy said, hey, come follow me. Actually, there was a little bit of relationship. But in Luke 5, Luke tells us they had been fishing all night. They caught nothing. And they were cleaning up their nets, which was a huge job to do. In our, our day, we'd say they had worked the night shift. They, they'd worked all night. And they're probably tired, ready to go home and get some sleep. And Jesus said, Lot's back out. And you remember Peter said, and we, we fished all night. And what he's trying to say is, hey, we, we've been working all night. But nevertheless, we'll do what you want us to do. And they caught more fish than they had ever caught before. The nets began to break. And they called the partners over. And that's when Jesus said, follow me, I'll make the fish of men. And so they understood some, something about who he, who he is. So his leadership, and this is genius, is so clear and understandable. Now, now you could write books on what he said, this one statement. Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. We call it an elevator speech. In other words, j just in one sentence, Jesus tell, tell me what you want me to do. Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Again, you could write books about it. Follow him is going to talk about tithing. Follow him is going to talk about prayer. Follow him is going to talk about the Word of God. Follow him talks about relationships. Follow, follow him talks about, you name it, if it's spiritual, that's discipleship. And then fishing for men is sharing the story. And, and by the way, if, if you try to create this environment, that's the order. Sometimes I go and train, I may find this tomorrow be this way. Sometimes I go and train, and here's the problem. I can go and train people in evangelism, but apathetic people don't witness. People who don't follow Jesus don't share Jesus. I'm, I'm just telling you, sharing Jesus puts you under the most spiritual warfare you're ever under. Because if you're actually sharing Jesus, you're invading the enemy's territory. You're trying to see lost people coming up. Jesus would say, hey, I want y'all to fit, fish for people. And, and what you got, you might want to follow me. You can't do it that way. He knew what he was doing. Follow me. That, that's your job. In fact, uh, my pastor always said it this way. The business the church is in, and it never never will not be in this business. This is the business we're in. We're in the following business. We follow Jesus. We're in the finding business. We find lost people. And then when we know who the lost person is, we fish. We tell them about Jesus. And, and Jesus, as a leader, over and over emphasized this. Uh, over and over he talks about the harvest. Towards the end of his ministry, he looks at the disciples and says, Hey, I want y'all to look at something. The fields are white to harvest. But then he says, The labors are few. And he's actually talking to them. And he tells them, You need to be part of reaping the harvest. And then he says, Secondly, not only do you need to be part of reaping the harvest, you need to pray. As you're reaping, pray that the Father raise up other leaders because the harvest is so huge it takes a lot of people to make an impact uh, in the harvest in reaching people so and let me say one last thing about Jesus' leadership in Jesus' leadership he kept saying the same thing over and over he kept repeating himself he did that because he understands we don't learn just by doing it one time I tell pastors all the time when I go into training like a day of evangelism that uh, you just can't train one day. You have to keep at it. In fact, you'll get tired of hearing yourself talk about reaching people. That there comes a, a time you'll think, Man, I, I've been, I haven't missed a Sunday in three months. No, don't always say something about let's reach people, let's reach people, let's reach people because you never drift towards evangelism. You always drift away from it. You, you, it's not natural to share Jesus. It's not natural to talk to neighbors. It's not na natural to do that. It's a supernatural thing. And other things will pull you away. Well, let me give you an example. So, 
as these guys follow him, he did this over and over. As these guys follow him, they saw something. They saw that wherever he went, he shared who he was and what he could do to save people. The woman at the well, Zacchaeus, Nicodemus at night, they saw over and over that he modeled it. Uh, there's a leadership uh, person, John Maxwell, I know where Chris has read a lot, I'm sure, that calls this the law of the picture. And what he says is, people do what people see. And boy, did they see it. around Jesus over and over and over. He talked about new life. He talked about accepting him. He talked about being born again. He used every opportunity to take conversations and turn those conversations into himself. Let me give you an example. The woman at the well went to draw water. And Jesus did what he always does. He, he, took, he took a daily conversation and turned it around. Uh, he said, give me some of the drink. And he knew that would get her attention because in that day, as you know, men didn't speak to women they didn't know in public, like in Jesus' day. And Jews didn't speak to Samaritans to start with. And so that got her attention. And she said somebody. And Jesus hooked her. He, and his answer to her question, why would you ask me? All he said was, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for what? And we don't know her facial expression. We don't know the word. I'm assuming she must have looked him up and down, like, where's your rope? Because she says, you don't have a rope and the well's deep. And he says, I'm not talking about physical water. So he took everyday conversation. And the disciples heard and saw those things. And then he did this. In Luke 15, and this is an example he did all the time. He repeats himself over and over. He, he, he says, this is, let me tell you three little stories. There's a woman who loses a coin. She's got other coins, but she sweeps the whole house. And she's not at peace until she finds what she's lost. He's not talking about coins. He's talking about souls. He says, there's a man who has a hundred sheep, and one gets lost. He's not content with 99. He doesn't say, well, I still have 99. He wants the one that got lost. He goes and pursues it. And he says, a man has two sons. And, but the man has one son that leaves, he wants that son back. He's not talking about really family relationships. He's talking about souls. He's talking about lost people. So over and over. So, so leadership is crucial. And then, then in the blueprint, there's five or six things we find that are scriptural. But we also find that when we look at churches of any size, churches that are run 25 in worship that are growing up to be 30 or 40, churches that like a Bethlehem, you mentioned Bethlehem, we find it at a church like Bethlehem. It doesn't matter the size of the church. Uh, one thing is we find that uh, churches that reach more people, they pray for lost people by name. In other words, it, when they pray and they take prayer requests, it's very unusual what you hear. You'll hear what you hear in almost every church. If The church I'm going to go to the more if the pastor before the training asks for prayer requests, if it's a normal church, I can tell you what they're going to pray for. They're going to pray prayers like this. Remember Miss Sue. She's going to have an operation this week. Remember so-and-so, they lost their job. And, and, and we should pray for those things. But what we find in churches that reach more people, lost people, you hear those kind of prayers, but you also hear this. Hey, pray for Joe. He's a new co-worker. He came about a week ago. He's lost. I got to share just a little bit about my church, a little bit about the gospel, but pray for him that I have another opportunity. And what we find is churches that pray for lost people, it gets on their mind. Well, for example, Brother Chris talked about deacons. Uh, because I knew this principle, when I became a pastor, one of my first deacon meetings, uh, they took prayer requests and we heard the normal prayer requests and I just said, hey, before y'all pray, uh, anybody got a lost person? And I knew they did because it wasn't part of the culture. They looked at me like, like that. And I said, hey. and I knew they would do that. But I had a name because I had witnessed somebody that week and I said, hey, that's okay. And I told my name from someone I had seen at Starbucks. I said, I met a so-and-so at Starbucks 
got to show a little bit, then get saved. But, but remember them in prayer. Maybe God will take that seed. Then I said this, hey, before, because the mouse is going to break. Before you pray, next month, I think I may ask that question again. I did it that way, and I'm talking to myself now. I did it like everybody's interested in winning souls. Well, they weren't because that wasn't the culture. But what you want is you want to start having leadership meetings one day where when there's prayer requests, somebody says, hey, and they name a name. And what happens is it's a reminder. If I'm sitting there in that digs meeting, if I'm sitting in a, in a small group, some school teachers meeting, uh, some kind of leadership meeting in church, and I never have a prayer request for a lost person, but, but all of you do, I'm going to leave that meeting kind of convicted. Like, I guess I might want to get me somebody on my mind that I'm trying to pray for and trying to... Uh, get an opportunity to witness to them. So pray for all still by name. Uh, a second thing we find is this in that blueprint. Uh, it's the Sunday morning experience. Here's what happens in churches. When you go to a church and you become a member, you don't really notice anything. Once you get used to it, you're used to it. Let me give you an example. A uh, number of years ago, it's been a long time ago now, my wife and I was going to a new ministry assignment, and we didn't have to move far, but we had to move probably about 30 miles. And so we'd been in our house about 10 years, and uh, we were going to even sell it. We loved that house. It wasn't a big house. It was, it was one of our first houses. It was the second house we ever bought. It was a small house. We loved it. But I knew it was going to have to sell it, so I got me a little clipboard. Uh, that was back before I think it even cell phones. Right? I got me a little clipboard, a piece of paper. I walked from one corner of the house all the way around to back to that corner. And something interesting happened. And it just it just it kind of shocked me. I thought that was the perfect house. This is my home. But all of a sudden, it wasn't my home anymore. It was an investment property. It was going to go on the market. As much as we loved that home, we wanted to sell as quick as it could and make as much as we could from it, obviously. And all of a sudden, Chris, I was like, you know, that trim up that that needs to be painted. One of the front windows had some large windows. At the very bottom, never noticed before, it, it looked like there was a little, little um, it was cracked, but real small. It looked like somebody almost had like taken a BB gun. I, I'm assuming maybe a, a rock and lumber, like a pebble. I just, I never, I'm like, that's a small crack there. You know why I never noticed it? Because it was on my home. I've got just didn't notice. It's like when you meet somebody or you see somebody you haven't seen in 10 years. You know what you'll notice? In fact, I saw someone a few days ago I hadn't seen in about eight, eight years. I ain't telling this what I noticed. Man, I got old of them. Then I got in my car and I thought, I bet they're saying the same thing about me. <laughs> you, you know why I don't notice it? Because every morning I see myself and you don't change much one day to the next. You actually do change if you start noticing You get into something else. But if you see somebody you haven't seen in 10 years, you'll notice. So the same more experience what you want to do is you want to look at everything you're doing on Sunday morning. And I'm talking about everything. I'm talking about from the time people arrive. Not just guess. This is for everybody. From the time people arrive to the time they leave. That, that, that includes preaching. That includes invitations. That includes how, how, do, you, how do you send people away. Uh, for example, I preach for pastors sometimes. Or if I'm not preaching and, they, and I'm just there to hear them preach and they give an invitation. They don't know they're doing this, but a lot of times they'll walk out of the pulpit and they've got their bullets on their Bible and they're standing there, but the first thing that they do, they're doing this, I know what they're doing. They're looking at the next thing. Whereas what they should be doing is giving them take. They should be doing like this. They should, I mean, I'm saying, giving them take with expectancy and nobody may come. But that's not my business. My business is to give the invitation. Now, my business is to have expectation. I shouldn't be surprised if somebody comes. I should be shocked if nobody comes because the Lord God is that good. He's such a great Savior. You, you just say, everybody wants to come and pray. No, but my point is, look through everything you're doing and critique it. Because once you get familiar with everything, you just don't notice that some things about your church. You just don't notice some things... Chris notices a lot. I notice a lot. Why? When you go to different churches every week, it's amazing how they treat you or, or don't pay attention to you because you're, you're not part of that church. And so, walk through everything that you do. And I will tell you this. 
any size church ought to have some kind of, you call it what you want to do, hospitality team. Uh, I like the term first impression team. A, a, a team, it, it, by the way, a team can be two people, but some kind of small team that is looking at Sunday morning. And uh, again, I went to a church not too long ago, and uh, there's a greater, and just, I mean, just outgoing and welcoming. And when I asked where something was, they said, well, let me, let me take and show you. But then they said this, and isn't this neat? They said, it's the first time here. I said, yes. They said, you're going to love it. Our pastor started a series on prayer last Sunday. That may be the best message on prayer I've ever heard. It's going to be good today. I thought to myself, that's the kind of church member I want. That's, if I'm passionate, I want to read like that. But I also knew this from being in church work. That was an accident. Somebody, somebody had trained that person. Somebody took the time to go to them and say, uh, maybe something like this. Hey, three weeks from now, the pastor's going to start a new series on prayer. There's going to be four messages. Here's the title and the theme. You may want to have that handy. If you come across a guest during one of these Sundays, you can let them know what we do. It, that, don't you think that's a nice touch that somebody... And I go to some churches where I may ask the greeter, we're such and such, and this is true. That's like, oh, I don't know. And you're sitting there thinking in your mind, are you going to find out for it? Are you, are you going to... And in church, we get used to that. The problem is we live in a culture that's not used to it. So, example, if you went to a Chick-fil-A this afternoon, and say so you went to the drive-thru and you said, hey, y'all still got uh, any peach milkshakes? If the person with the uniform and name tag at Worship Street Lake says, I don't know, you'd probably think, you work here, you ought to know. A guest expects an usher or a greeter to know about the church. And I'm just telling you, think through everything that you do. Uh, think about next steps. And we can do a whole lesson on this, but just think it's, it's crucial. In fact, they tell us, I believe this, ever since I've been ministering, this has been true. They tell us that a first time guest within about five to eight minutes. I, I, I've never seen it above eight minutes. So we'll, just, we'll, we'll go with that. They make up their mind whether they'll come back the next week. That's convicting. Because if they get there five or six minutes early, it means they make up their mind before they hear the singing. They make up their mind before they, they, they certainly make it up before they hear the preaching. Most churches have about 30 minutes of singing before the preacher gets up. I've never seen a survey that said they make up their mind in the first 40 minutes. I've never, it's always, eight, nine minutes is the longest of any survey I've ever seen. I've been keeping up with this for 35 years. I've never seen one more than eight or nine minutes. Which means, unless the preacher preaches first, which is, I, you don't see that, it's music first. They don't even get to hear the preacher preach. They make their mind. I say that as an exaltation. If you're on a first impression team or you're a greeter, you have one of the most important jobs in the church. You, 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 are, the, you are the person that they see first before they see anything else. A third thing is this, uh, personal evangelism. Churches that really major on reaching people, that become fishers of men, they're very intentional about personal evangelism. They talk about it. Uh, they model it. And just like Jesus, uh, it's good for pastor and staff and people who are on the stage. By the way, the staff doesn't have to be a paid person. It's somebody who leads music, somebody who's a deacon, somebody who's, who's a visible leader. It's important that, that they take the opportunity to talk about the fact they've been sharing Christ. For example, I don't get to go to my home church very much, but my pastor is a great soul winner. I never go, but that he doesn't share something. It may be just something in a message. It may be, uh, you know, right before a prayer time, he may just say, hey, y'all pray, y'all pray for me, he'll name a name. Uh, I went to a restaurant the other day and got to share Jesus, and he may say, they didn't get saved, but I'm hoping to get to go back there. What he's doing is he's letting his people know that I not only preach to you about sharing Jesus, I not only preach to you about inviting people, I'm doing it just like you are. I'm out there trying to invite people and do those things. So personal evangelism. Uh, in the state of Georgia, any size church, if we look at a church that runs 30, and for their size church, they're baptizing more than, than most of the other churches running 30, or if you're a big church running 3,000, it doesn't matter. For all size churches, 
the top churches that are baptizing and reaching people in those size category, almost 90% of them have at least one time of intentional evangelism training, personal evangelism training every year. Some do more than that, but, but they have at least one time of personal evangelism training. Because what they're trying to do, they're trying to keep it before their people that we need to be sharing Jesus. Right underneath that, and I'm not putting it on the same level, right underneath sharing the gospel, you need to create a culture of inviting people. You need to make sure we're inviting people. I'll give you an example. Uh, Peter is one of these first two guys that we just read about that got called. Simon and his brother got called. Simon, before he's called Peter, remember how he met Jesus? Andrew didn't witness to him. Andrew didn't say, hey man, Peter, I'm going to talk about something. All have seen him do that. He came to him and said, Now I just saw somebody. I believe this is my son. Come and see. He brought his brother to Jesus and Jesus shared. In fact, if y'all remember Billy Graham, Billy Graham did all these huge crusades uh, in his ministry. He borrowed that, and every crusade he did, there was a section in training called Operation Andrew. What it meant was, you need to put names on a paper of the lost people you know. You pray for them and get them to the crusade. Because if they come to the crusade, they're going to hear the gospel and there's a high possibility they might come to Christ. Local churches that way invite people. And the, and the more people invite people, here's how it works. Sometimes pastors tell me, I probably invite three or four five people a week. And that's awesome. He's just one guy. He's, he's talking about out there in the community. Like he's just invites to the restaurant. Here's the problem with that. Pastor is one man, is one leader. What if 10 people, or what if everybody here said on average week I invite five people? Well, you start counting the people here, all of a sudden we're not inviting five people a week, we're inviting 60 or 80 or 100. That's when you begin to see more people coming. And, and when you look at the same community, what happens is you'll find that church members sometimes go to the same places of business. And so let's just say a restaurant. A local restaurant you might occasionally go to, there's probably other church members. Before you know it, that waitress thinks, Man, I've been invited three or four times in the last six weeks to the same church. What, what, what's up with this? Maybe I should go check it out. And that's the impact of doing that. A uh, fourth, uh, fourth thing in the actual blueprint uh, is, and I, I'm not counting leadership as a point, but fourth thing in the actual blueprint is that they focus on event evangelism. Event evangelism. Let me tell you what I mean this. They, uh, we mentioned VBS, Vacation Bible School. So that's an event. Uh, and, and every church doesn't do the same events, but events like Vacation Bible School, events like a uh, maybe a high attendance day, maybe you have a special speaker, but whatever events you might want to do, and every church has certain events. It, to me, Easter's an event. Uh, when, when Easter comes in April this year, that is an event. They take their events and they'll build a team. And, and I'll say this again. A team can be any size. The, the bigger the event, the more the larger teams are. But a team might be three people. I would say this though. If I pastor a church of average 25 people on Sunday morning, I would rather have a team of two people than do it by myself. For a couple of reasons. One reason is I'm gonna assume that if I have a couple people helping me, that we're smarter together than, than I am by myself. In other words, I'm gonna learn something that, that they they've got some wisdom they can add to the event. Secondly, this is huge. You're training leaders. So if, if I've got two people helping me plan vacation Bible skills, and maybe at first I have to do most of the work, there may come a time where I can look at one of those people and say, Hey, Susie, I've noticed that you really know what you're doing with this. What if next year I'll serve on the team? Why don't you be the, the, the chairperson of the team? And what I'm trying to do, they don't know this, I'm trying to work it out. Well, one day I don't have to go in that team. Well, she can, she, she's just, or he or she, whatever, has that vacation Bible school or wherever the event is. So let me give you an example. I, I would put a team together for Easter. And I'd ask questions. 
How can we make this the best Easter we ever had? What would we need to do? What would that need to look like? And I would ask questions, like somebody who works in children's ministry. What would be something you could do on Easter Sunday with the children that they would leave, they would leave our church that morning thinking, especially if they're visiting, that they would walk into the car, you would hear a statement like this. Mama, can we come back? If you ever done BBS, have you ever been in the parking lot when, when the kids are being let out? Have you ever listened? You'll hear kids say, can we come back tomorrow? Yeah. You want that one Sunday. When I was a pastor, we didn't have it. It took about seven months to get it. I tell our children's team, I want people to leave here on Sunday like they leave VBS for our children. I want, I, want I want folks to leave. I want that third grader who's a first time visitor with, with the mother or maybe the second time and, sh and this third grader is in our children's church as they're going out to the car the mom's picking them up the dad and mom I want the kid to be saying mom, mom, can we come back next week? People love to take their kids to a church that the kids love to go to they, they, they love to do it so anyway, think through your events now the next thing is this think through what I call Servant evangelism, and some people call it ministry evangelism. Uh, what that is, we live in a day where, I like it was 30 years ago or so, especially when I first got in ministry, which is much longer than that. Uh, you can have revival meetings. In fact, I did revival meetings, and y'all might even have revivals, but I did what we call revival meetings uh, in college that were really good, not because I was just, it's, it's the culture of that day. And, and looking back on it, some of these country churches that I was preaching in in those days, uh, when I would be doing a revival, we might stop by a little country store, and they'd have a little photo of me in that country store, but they ran the photo off like a copy machine. I knew it was me because of the name. I, I didn't even recognize I mean, you couldn't tell who it was, and you would think, well, nobody's going to come. But in those days, they did come. We don't live in that day anymore. We just we don't live in that kind of day. And so... One thing that most churches do today is this. They look for some kind of opportunity. At least one. I'm going to get 10 or 15, but just one opportunity. What is something we can do that's off campus, that ministers to somebody? The church I pastor was easy because where, where our church was, on one side was a Methodist church. Well, that's a Methodist church. Across the street was Burger King. That's Burger King. But over here was an elementary school. We're like, well, that's, that's it. They say, I mean, and I say over here, I mean, it's like you can stay in our parking lot. There's a small road between us. But you can throw a rock and get their parking lot. It's like, that's where we ought to start. So we begin to make some inroads uh, into ministering uh, in, that, in that elementary school. And I don't have time to go into detail. But for us, it worked. It worked extremely well. It was, just, it was amazing what God allowed us to do. It took about seven or eight months once we got our foot in the door where they trusted us, it was amazing what they allowed us to do and how they allowed us to minister and so on. But look for an opportunity. It doesn't have to be a school, but look for some kind of an opportunity as to how you can impact uh, outside the walls of the church. You have, to build, you have to be able to build bridges more so today than probably any time, at least in my ministry, uh, because people, uh, the unchurched don't think about church like they used to. You, if if y'all had been a church here 50 years ago and you had some, some kind of event unchurched people would have conversations like married couples would have conversations like this well Easter's coming up what church you want to go to and they just they just saw in fact I didn't grow up in a home here went to church every Easter we got uh, what we call some, some new some new Sunday school clothes just because my parents thought it's Easter we have to go to church and I remember I mean, I was in third grade. I remember conversations between my mother and stepdad just overhearing it where they would say, well, the church is having a Bible this week. What not you want to go? They almost felt obligated, like since it was a revival going on, we ought to show up at least one night, which is a great thing because it means that guy preaching every night, he had unchurched people show up. Those days are over with. So look for opportunities. How can, what could we do to build bridges to the community? Uh, and the last thing is this the, the last thing is called team evangelism and team evangelism is basically saying that, that 
evangelism is always best done through a team. By the way, that's what Jesus is doing in Mark 1. He's building a team. And I always thought this. If Jesus is God, He needs a team. I need a team. He's building a team. And He did a great job. He, he built the most famous team ever called the Twelve Disciples. And when He ascended to heaven, those guys stepped right in and started preaching. I mean, they, 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 they did what they saw Jesus model. They, 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 they served, they preached, they loved. It's amazing what God used them. They weren't perfect. It's just amazing what God used them. But, but He built that. He built that team. I would say in our day, and every church is different, if you have small groups, y'all have Sunday school here. So the great thing about having Sunday school is most Sunday school classes, small group classes, are built around some kind of uh, unity, meaning like, like a, a high school Sunday school class. Well, who goes there? Well, it's got a teacher and they got high school students. A children's Sunday school class. A young married, a senior adult. They're already, they're already built to reach people. And I will tell you this, if you study Sunday school, when Sunday school first started, it was started to reach lost people. That, that's what it was. Uh, that, that's why I, if someone came to march your church and said, I'm lost, I'd like to join your church. Well, you're going to talk about Jesus. You don't, you don't know enough that lost people join the church. But they, they, in most churches, they can join Sunday school. We, we, won't, we won't lost people to join Sunday school. Why? Because if you start coming to Sunday school and you listen to the teacher teaching the Bible, there's a high percent chance that in the future you won't get saved because you're under the Word of God. What's happened is, is a lot of churches have Sunday school classes and it's kind of like a fellowship time. We say the Bible, but we just, it's our little group and, so, and we're not inviting people. So take those small groups. I'm using the term small groups because not every church only has a Sunday school during Sunday. Some church have like Wednesday night Bible studies, like different like women's Bible studies and so on. So unless it's a discipleship Bible study that's strictly for a saved person uh, that you're trying to grow deeper in Christ, it's what we call an open class, which means you can invite anybody. And uh, it's, it's like starting a church. This church, there's, the reason there's a church here, somebody started this church. And that's true of every church. Every church had a first Sunday. Here's the great thing about a small group. Let, let's just say that this room, let's just make this up, let's say this room was not used on Sunday morning. Let's just say it wasn't. It means that if you could raise up a leader, you could start a small group here. If you start a small group here, and let me just say this, this is, this is always happening. So we decided to do this when I was a pastor. And I had a friend who went to plant a church. Uh, from the mission board. He went to Manhattan, New York, and still there, the same church is doing a great job. I'm not a church planner, so it always fascinated me. And I asked him, how did you how did you do this? And he said, well, we went through the North American Mission Board and raised money. I said, no, I understand about raising money. I get that part of it. Who did you know that you didn't know anybody? What did you do? He said, well, we got us an apartment and began to pray for all the other people who live in the apartment. And uh, we began to be friendly intentionally. And once we thought we'd build up relationships, we finally asked a few people, hey, would y'all be available this coming Friday come to our house uh, at such and such time for coffee and dessert? When they came over, he said, towards the end of that time together, we said, hey, we won't show up. We won't we'll let y'all know why we are here. We're planting a church. We're about to start some Bible studies. Would any of you be interested? He said, they all weren't, but a few were. So I thought about that and I thought, in the church I was at, we have some empty sex school winners. He had to actually raise money. We've already got the rooms. And on Sundays, they're heated and cool. We're already paying the electric bill. I mean, everything's in place. It's just we don't have people there. Right? And so the first person we went to, we went to a young guy who was married at the time, about 36 or so. And uh, we made an appointment with him for a lunch date. He will be another guy. And when we, in fact, it was Kenneth Acock. We met with him, and uh, he was so curious about Randolph, he couldn't help it. So he said, well, Pastor, I just, I, I know you just about to have to eat beef. What, what's, what's going on? And I said, Well, you're right, we got an agenda. 
And I looked at him and said, and this guy teaches leadership at the University of Georgia. And he's a great Christian. He wasn't teaching anything. I don't think he'd ever taught. So I asked him, I said, I want you to pray about something. I want you to talk to your wife about this and y'all pray together. We would like to start a new class on Sunday morning. We'd like for you to be the leader of it. And I said, now, nah, I don't think you've ever taught for you. I have. I said, that's not a problem. And I told him, because it was trusting your spiritual man, the way you raise your family, the way you can do your character. I said, we can help you with the teaching, uh, you know, life, waste, and see lessons. We, we can help with that. I said, I need a leader. And don't you pray about it. And then I said, but I want you to know something. If God leads y'all to do this, I'm not giving you anybody. You're going to have an empty classroom. But I know you can do it because a friend called Patrick left Georgia and went to Manhattan. They didn't know anybody. I said, you know everybody. Now, God probably never lets do this again. We put him in a large room. In about 12, 14 months, he had about 50-something people there. None of them were church members. Now, they were church members when they got saved. I mean, they weren't church members when they started. That's, that's what I'm talking about. It doesn't have to be that big of a thing. It might be that you raise up somebody... And maybe, by the way, you can give them a couple of people. That doesn't matter. We didn't on that. But let them begin to invite people. Just like a church plant. It's not a church, but it's a small group. And what happens is, you get enough of those things going. And, and by the way, we picked the right guy who was the leader. So once it grew, we went back and said, Hey, hey uh, Randolph, have you noticed that you don't have room for everybody else? Yeah, I've noticed that. You won't be able to grow anymore. We need to take some people out of there. And here's the great thing about new teachers. You know what I said? Sounds good to me when, when you'll do this. Because I had some teachers who fired me before they lose one person. But this guy was like, sounds good, Pastor. What are you do? I said, well, give us a few weeks. We'll put some things together. I said, we're at about 55 or so. We think we're going to take about 20 active people away. But what will happen is you'll have 35. You'll grow it back up and you'll have room to do it. He did that well over time. But then we had a good problem. Then we were able to say, hey, we don't need his kind of leader. We, we don't need a guy on his level. He's like a high level leader. Because whoever has this other class, we're going to start too. They're both going to start with 10 active people in their class. So, so they don't have to grow from nothing to 20. They grow from like 10 to 15 to 20. So, but my point is, that's what I mean by doing ministry through a team. Look at your small groups and begin to ask yourself, when should we start this small group? Well, it might be a year from now. You might, you might say you do it next week. But begin to think through it. Who's a leader? Who's the type of leader that would invite people? Because see, what Randolph did is, everybody he saw, he invited. I mean, he went across the street uh, to neighbors. Hey, I'm not teaching Bible study. Love to come. Well, not, well, where is it? Let's sit down at church. And he didn't do that with my preaching. I mean, he, he, he'd he go across the street and say, hey, our pastor's going to preach on whatever this week. But he had to buy into what he was doing. And then the last thing I will tell you is this. Whatever your management strategy is, and it takes prayer to know what God wants you to do, you can't do everything. You just like the things I just mentioned, you can't leave here and say, we're going to do this, and we're going to do this one, and this one. Just pick one thing. What is the one thing we could work on that would help us? And then once you kind of get down with maybe go move on something else. I will tell you, you never lie. I don't know. I, I, I've never in ministry felt like, man, we've got this down. I felt like we had some good things going, but I never thought we were perfect in what we're doing. I don't think we were perfect evangelists or a perfect witness. You're always striving to be better. But once you decide those things, here's our evangelism strategy, here's what we're going to do, here, here, here's what we think through prayer, and of course the pastor is the one that's really going to set the tone for this. Here's the first thing we have to concentrate on. When you do all that, you need to do this. Number one, use your stage. Your stage. And, and, and I mean your physical stage. That stage in there, make sure you're weaving your strategy through that stage. I don't know if this has happened to you. It's happened to me before. Have you ever been in a church where leadership says something? We're going to do this, this, and this. And like eight weeks later, you're with somebody and they say, well, what about such and such that they mentioned a couple months ago? And the response is, I ain't heard nothing else about it. In other words, sometimes we talk about we're going to do this. And then what happens is 
It's never really brought, brought about two weeks, and then a year goes by, and you're like, whatever became of that? Don't let it happen with your evangelism. Whatever, whatever you feel like you should be doing, just like you know this coming, which is tomorrow, you probably know who's going to pray, who's going to lead music, which pastor's preaching. If there's a baptism, you, you, you know what you're going to do. There, there's, there's an order. Have an order, not that you give out to everybody, but make yourself a note. How am I going to talk about evangelism this Sunday? And I don't mean an hour. It, it could be 30 seconds. Uh, when I was a pastor, sometimes, for example, not, not every time I was baptized, but sometimes when we baptize, I'm going to make myself a note and just say something like this. Man, this is, this is what it's all about. This is the only reason we exist is to point people to Jesus. Uh, but ask yourself, what are we going to do tomorrow? What are we going to do next Sunday? So ever since, so, so weave it through that through that stage and make sure it stays before the congregation. This is who we are. This is what we're about. Second thing is this. Use your stage. Also use what I call your staff. Let, let, let me explain this. Uh, you know, most churches in Georgia, the only paid staff the average church has is the pastor. And, and, and sometimes the pastor is not full time. We have probably Georgia Baptist, we probably have you know, 46 or 47 percent of our churches are by vocation. I mean, the pastor has no job because the church is, just has to have no job. When I say staff, though, staff is not always paid people. Uh, my first church I pastored, I was in seminary, it was a uh, I was, it was a four-time church. So obviously I was the only one. I think, I think this panel probably got paid something. But uh, I was the only staff member, but I was part-time. But God blessed me because I had three deacons, and I had three great deacons, which is probably, I had, really had, I had three great deacons. Two of them were retired. And those two who were retired, they're actually in heaven now. One had a pretty large business, so during the week, I didn't always see him a lot because he traveled some. But the two who was retired, I'm going to tell you, they were my staff. And they, they didn't pay anything, but anytime I was going to do anything, of course they were retired, uh, when I was on the field, the church field, I could call them and say, hey, could y'all meet tomorrow? Or, what time do you want to meet? I ran everything by them, we prayed together. Uh, sometimes they gave me good advice, I was real young, like, Pastor, you can do that, I'm not sure, we tried it for 20 years, but it didn't work well. And I, and I, I listened to those guys, because like, they knew they had a lot of godly wisdom. But my point is, hey, you asked me, you have staff, I would say, yeah. I got a couple staff guys, and, and in fact, somebody did that one time. I said, "We kind of small. I had a couple. I said, well, I'll get paid. They're two of my deacons." But but I was serious. These two guys were staff. So so whoever you consider staff in this church, uh, somebody says, "We got a great chairman of deacons. We've got we've got a Sunday school teacher who just I mean they go above and beyond." Make sure they buy into the band strategy. I'll give you an example. We decided. To create a culture of invitation, we wanted we wanted the church to be inviting people. We just thought I think every church should feel this way. What's going to happen here tomorrow is the greatest thing in Georgia. I mean, Jesus is going to be preached. I mean, I, I believe that all It's the greatest thing going on, and that is that Jesus is being worshipped. Jesus is going to be preached, and there are people all around us who desperately need to hear that message. And so we make sure we're inviting people. So, long story short, we got what we call invite cards, and we decided somebody every Sunday is going to say something about stage. So we did. Uh, after we got the invite cards, I was probably there another five and a half years. We didn't miss a Sunday. I'm making a confession. About three months into it, I was at my desk on Thursday, and there was an invite card in the corner of the desk. It was just a reminder that, hey, this Sunday, somebody. I didn't always, I wasn't always going to say something. Somebody's going to say something. But that Sunday was kind of my turn to say something. And I spoke out loud. I said, Lord, I'm not, I mean, also, I'm not doing this Sunday. My mother used to have a phrase when I grew up, if I kept, as a kid, in like second third grade, if I kept saying something over and over, she'd say, Son, you sound like a broken record. That old phrase. So I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I sound like a broken record. I just feel, and then it dawned on me, no, the impact of those invite cards lies in the foundation of the big mission every week. And so we did it. But what we did is we went to staff, key leaders, social teachers, Lord, and deacons, and we let them know God has laid something on our heart. You know why? Because if I didn't do that and got up on Sunday and said, we're going to start doing invite cards, 
You know what's going to happen? The next day, maybe that day, somebody's going to see one of our deacons. Or, uh, what, what's this about invite cards? And it will kill you if the deacon says, oh, yesterday's the first time I heard anything about it. I don't know what's going on. And so we made sure this is what we're doing. I told them the first Sunday. The first Sunday I did. I, mean, I made sure I was the guy doing it. I said this. I said, sometimes we have events in church. This is not an event. This is a strategy. This will not go away. Every Sunday you're going to hear something. Even Easter. I mean, it didn't matter what day it was. Something was said about the end of our uh, I think the first Easter we said something like, uh, wow, isn't this awesome? We got a full house. By the way, some of this is just the result of those invite cards that we invite people all the time. My point is, we always look for opportunities. So use your stage, use your staff, then use what I call your structure. Your structure, not your physical structure, but, but the structure, spiritual structure of your church. Whatever makes up your church, you, you say, well, we've got a youth program, you say, we've got a children's program, whatever makes up your church. Weave that strategy through everything you do. So, we were very intentional. Uh, you got a person, volunteer works with students or with children. Get with them. What are you doing and how can we help when it comes to evangelism? We went to our children's person, which was part-time. I had to get somebody part-time. Also, we got a few people. She's still there, by the way. Uh, because we grew. The, the, the inbox worked. But my point is, we went, we went to her, she had no staff on, so I didn't know, and sat down with her and said, give us some ideas on how you could use invite cards and challenge your children to invite people. And so, throughout the course of the year, she did so this, she, she, might, she might let me know, hey, Pastor, just let you know, two weeks from now, you might see a lot of kids in pajamas. Now, that's what we have pajamas Sunday. I got news for you. They, 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 some Sundays, once they start growing, they have 30, 40 new kids there just because some third grader by the third grade friend, which is a neat thing. The, the third grade can't get there by themselves. Somebody had to bring them. Which the but the point is, we, we, we weaved it through our structure. Sunday school teachers, we play with this. Wouldn't it be sad if we're going to have invites as part of our strategy? It wasn't the only thing in our strategy, part of our strategy. If we're going to have invite cards, wouldn't it be a shame if here's a Sunday school teacher who's well respected and three years into it, they haven't mentioned it one time in their Sunday school. See what I'm wrong with this? You have to have some buy-in. So we got our calendar out and said, let's pick four Sundays, that's once a quarter, where we meet with the Sunday school teachers and we give them an invite card and we say, on such and such Sunday, when you dismiss your class, you give everyone an invite card and tell them, here's your homework for this week. Here's your assignment. Do not come back with that card. Don't leave it at home. Put this card somewhere. We don't care if you leave it with a tip at a restaurant. We don't care if you go across the street and give it to your neighbor. Give it to somebody this week. But my point is, we looked at every opportunity we could to keep that evangelism ministry going. Because again, you never drift toward an angel you drift away from. Uh, you don't, it's not natural. If you don't focus on it, you'll, you'll do a lot of good things, but you won't be reaching people like you'd like to reach. That, that's all I've got. But any, any questions before I sit down about outreach evangelism? Let me say one thing. And Chris, you probably agree with this. Uh, and I'll get you just a second. Let me say this real quick. Well, I, don't forget, I don't forget this. Uh, you know, when you, when you come and do something on Saturday, in some of our church, you have three people show. This is passion. This is a great group on a Saturday morning to come out. So, not knowing a lot about your church, this is a great core group to have on a Saturday morning. Cold, lots going on. A lot of you worked all week. I just want to compliment y'all. In fact, I'll tell Chris for sure. I said, "Wow, they, you guys have showed up. That's a great thing." Yes, sir. Yeah, question. I know we're talking about reaching out. Yes, great. But. Uh, Today, Chair, I know I understand like Sunday school is very important. Yeah. But what can you do to encourage the church members to attend Sunday school? Yeah. Do you have anything to like encourage and touch, touch us for for us? Yeah, there's a few things you can probably do. I'll tell you one thing I I, I did and uh well, of course I got from John Hunt, I'm sure it wasn't original with him. 
I didn't do this every Sunday, but maybe about every six weeks or so, I would say something to the church. Usually if I made an announcement or if I was going to do the prayer, uh, I would say something, just maybe every six weeks or so, I'd say, hey, we, we live in a busy county, this, this busy area y'all are in, growing area, some of you drive into Atlanta to work, and y'all are busy. I would say this, do me a favor as your pastor. If you're just so busy, that you don't have time for Sunday school in church. Don't come to church. I'd rather you come to Sunday school. Because I knew this. I knew that if people get involved in a small group, they stay in church longer. In fact, I'd say, I say I preach Bible school where a pastor has told me after the Sunday morning service, you may have seen some people leaving after Sunday school, they're mad at me. That's interesting. They're mad at the pastor, but they ain't gonna miss Sunday school. I've known people who, for whatever reason, will will go to Sunday school here and don't do here, here and drive five miles down the road to go to church. Yeah. And that's why we have one reason we emphasize Sunday school. There's some about a small group. That's where ministry occurs. So that's one thing I would do. Uh, you won't get everybody. You won't ever get everybody in Sunday school. But that's one thing I would do is is to make sure it's emphasized from the platform. Uh, I tell you about our day, and this is true with evangelism too. I always listened to what people were telling me. I was always on the lookout for a good testimony. It could be a tithing testimony. Uh, for example, one time a young couple saw me and said, you know, we, we've been tithing about three months. It's amazing how God has blessed us. And I would say this. If it was really good, I'd say, let me ask you a favor. First I'd say, that's awesome. Let me ask you a favor. Is there, is there a day when you might could make an appointment and come up to the church and let, let one of our media guys videotape that testimony and because uh, we'd like to show it. The great thing about videotaping is if it's really good, you can show it a few times throughout the year. So I might go to my Sunday school teacher and say, hey, would you mind recording, would you mind meeting us, make an appointment and maybe recording a 90 second testimony about what Sunday school means to you? I might go to my Sunday school teacher and say this, do you have a member or two that just, they're just ecstatic about Sunday school. Like they're, they're, just, they're, just, they're just excited. Give you an example. One time we decided this on, on, uh, on uh, tithing, living life of generosity. So we sat down, I sat down with a few people and said, I'd like to put a video, not a video, but some different testimonies. And what I'd like is, this is just, this was our church, so specific. I said, I'd love to have like a senior adult. I'd love to have a young couple. I said, I'd love to have a student. We've got some black people. In other words, I, want, I want enough videos that it represents the different segments of our church. And those things went over well. But the great thing about it is some of the ones that were just, they hit a home run, we thought, well, slave that to come up three months from now, we'll show it again. <clears throat> well, you can do some things like that. But you, you just, you keep it before people and you constantly talk about it. And then when somebody joins, immediately talking about small group, talking about Sunday school, and get somebody, whatever age group they would fit in, get that teacher to make a personal contact with that person. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, what is your suggestion on uh, bringing uh, family members or brother or sister back to church and you know once they attend church and they decide that you know I think I'm gonna cool off for a while but then it's, it's been too long that is there something that you can suggest to bring them back what I would do is uh, I would I would put them on a prayer list that I saw every day. I'd be praying for them every day. But I would pray for them every day. And by the way, and not just family members or friends, like a next door neighbor. And I wouldn't do, don't, don't put 50 names out because that's too many, but I would have two or three people on the list, at least one. And what I would do is I would be praying for them. And so, as I begin to pray for them, and, I, and I'm just going to make this up because I, I'm sure you've talked to them, but let's say as I pray for them, let's say I haven't talked to them yet. As I pray for them, I would also be praying for me, Lord, impress upon me 
when I should go and talk to them about getting, getting back in church. Now, the interesting praying and talking is this. I'm not going to talk to them every time I see them. I mean, every time I see them, I don't even think, oh no, he's going to talk about it again. So I'm going to be very sensitive. I'm going to talk one time, and then I'm going to be sensitive about what else. But because they're on my list, let's just say I had that list right now. I'd already be thinking, Lord, I've talked to him two or three times. I invite him to a Christmas, special Christmas service, whatever. But Easter's coming up in April, so I'm really praying that they come. So I'm going to be looking to talk to them maybe a week or two before Easter and just, just tell them, hey, we're having a great Easter service. I know you've talked about getting back in church. It's be a great Sunday to come visit uh, or come back to church. So I'll be looking at those kind of opportunities. Not everybody's going to do it, but here's the neat thing. I'm glad you brought this up. If I'm the pastor and leaders in the church, I don't just look at you doing it. If everybody's doing what you're talking about, what's going to happen is somebody, some people will come. If, if, if everybody's working on a neighbor who's, who's lost, who doesn't go to church, every neighbor's not going to come, but some of those neighbors will come over time. And by the way, if you do it enough, you'll just, because we did this, you'll find that sometimes somebody will come and when you, they make it say, but when you talk to them while you're on, like, well, tell, tell me your story. Like, what was your, I had people tell me things like, well, you know, I had a neighbor that uh, gave us an invite card a couple years ago and I wasn't interested. I heard this stuff all the time. I just wasn't interested. But for some reason, when I went back in my house after they gave it to me, I don't know, I just stuck on the side of my refrigerator and imagine I just been there two years. I hear stories like this. And my wife left them last week. Or our teenage son died in a car wreck. And I knew, I knew I needed something. I don't know why it came to my mind, which I know why I got talking to my mother. They said, I don't know why, but it occurred to me, hey, my neighbor gave me a card one, one day. I got to decide, well, what church was that? But my point is, our, our job is to do what you're doing, just pray and invite. But God has to be the one that draws. But if enough people do that, you'll, you'll, you'll look around. In fact, when we started doing this, not, not everybody bought in at first. They weren't, they fought me, but they just, they, not everybody bought in. But one, once we started reaching more people, I'd have people always not say, uh, Pastor, uh, I remember a deacon one time looked at me and said, uh, Pastor, uh, I know some Wednesday nights, I've been going to this church for 30 years, I'm having to park further away than I used to. I'm like, well, well you should be having to park. We've got a lot more people going on Wednesday night. He said, well, I knew, I knew some of those. I said, he said, is that, is that always an invite? Well, I said, yeah. I said, we have so many people invite people that we're beginning to reap some of the fruits of, of uh, people coming and stuff. So, anything else? All right, thank you so much, uh, Brother Stephen. I bet you're all hungry, so we're going to eat and then.